Continuing on with the superposition principle, we are going to look at calculating the expectation value for energy when we have a wave function which exists within multiple uh, individual eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian. So we have our function f of x, which is in our Dirac notation our total wave function, which is a linear combination of many different uh, eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian, potentially an infinite number of them. So if we want to calculate the expectation value of energy, then we have our expectation value, as we know, would be the integral of f star of x, h, f of x, integrated from negative infinity to infinity dx, this direct notation integral here. And as we said that this f function is a sum from n equals 1 to infinity of cn eigenfunction n. <clears throat> okay, so let's substitute in this expression here into our uh, energy expression. Hopefully this is all going to fit on the line here. We're going to have sum n equals 1 to infinity C n star because this is a this is the complex conjugate of that wave function and then the bra part of the bracket which is n and then h and h is going to act on and now this is a separate index. So <clears throat> this index n runs from 1 to infinity. And independently, there's going to be another index which runs from 1 to infinity. So we're going to call that m. So keep those two uh, separate there. So we have some cm and then eigenfunction m. OK, so right away, we can see we've got this constant here, this constant there. Those two are going to multiply. We can pull those out in front of the integral because the integrals are linear. We can pull the sum out as well because that integral is a linear operation. Let's go to the next color. So we have expectation value E equals sum of N equals 1 to infinity. We have a double sum now, so M equals 1 to infinity. Cn star, Cm, N, H, M for that integral. Now, looking at this, we can remind ourselves that these eigenfunctions M and N are eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian. So for them, we have the case that H acting on some N gives the energy of that nth eigenfunction the energy eigenvalue times the function back. So this h acting on this m here is going to give em. So then we can pull that out in front of the integral as well. And our integral that's left over is just going to be an overlap integral between n and m. And again, this is all in Dirac notation, so if you have no clue what's going on with the notation here, go back and watch the video on Dirac notation, and it'll all be explained very well. Okay, so CN star CM, we're pulling out the value of EM we get from the Hamiltonian acting on M within that integral, and we're left with NM. Okay, now in the previous video, we noted that these eigenfunctions are eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is a Hermitian operator, and for Hermitian operators, these eigenfunctions are orthonormal to each other. So orthonormality implies that this integral of n star times m over all of space equals the Kronecker delta from the previous video, which means it's 1 if they are equal to each other, m and n, and it's 0 if they're not. And that's, the, that's called being orthonormal. They're both orthogonal and normalized. Okay, so using that, then continuing on, we have 
expectation value of e for the most general type of function f of x, sum n equals 1 to infinity, m equals 1 to infinity, coefficient cn star, its complex conjugate of cn, times cm, times the energy of the mth eigenvalue, times the Kronecker delta for m and n. Now let's look at, for, at just this inner loop here, this second part of that double sum. Within this inner loop here, there's going to be one and exactly one, val one instance where this Kronecker delta is not equal to zero. So every term inside this loop is going to equal zero except for the case where m equals n. So this entire inner, inner loop is going to go away and just re be replaced with the value of when n when m equals n. So moving forward down to the next line, we have that e equals the sum of 1 to infinity, n equals 1 to infinity. Uh, when m equals n, we still have cn star. cm beca becomes cn because this is only non-zero when m equals n. And then this e becomes en because if it's not en, then Kronecker delta is going to be zero. And the Kronecker delta is just one, so we just leave it out. It's implied in there. Okay, so this is the remainder of what our expectation value is. Then going to the next side here, we have that that expectation value of e equals, now this sum from n equals one to infinity, Whenever you have a number times its complex conjugate, that's uh, equal to what we call the absolute magnitude squared. So the absolute magnitude of a complex number is kind of analogous to like a hypotenuse length if you think the two sides are the imaginary and the real part. So the, this, this value squared ends up being the imaginary part squared times the real part squared, and it's called the absolute value squared absolute magnitude squared times en. Okay, so this is a somewhat final result. What does this tell us? This tells us when we have a wave function which exists in many, many states, let's say it's, let's say we have some n equals 1 with some e equals 1, and then like in the particle in a box, let's say there's a quadratic difference here we have then e equals 4 for n equals 2 if we're in units of 8 over ml squared. Then we can have some coefficient in front of these. Let's say the coefficient for this one is 1 third. The coefficient for the state, this lower state is square root of 2 thirds. Then this, these coefficients squared, this expression is pretty much equal to another expression in probability theory, which is basically that of a weighted average. So if you have a bunch of different possible values for an outcome and they each have a and they each have a different probability, then the probability of observe the probability of observing a certain value is this probability coefficient out in front here, and the average value is each individual value times its probability. So if we have so in this case we have and the probability then is equal to this c n star c n for the probability of observing the nth state. So the probability for observing a certain eigenvalue is we would have the probability of observing the energy E equals one would be two thirds here, and the probability of observing the energy uh four would be one third. And then our expectation value, if you did the weighted average of those three, is, let me get myself some better space in there, the expectation value then would be three. If you did one third times four plus two thirds times one, you would get, you would get this energy here. Oh, sorry, this is not the correct value. I want it to be down lower. So we had one third. Sorry, I put the two third down here, so it's actually going to be down there. 
the expectation value is going to be 2. If you do 1 third times 4 plus 2 thirds times 1, you'll get that the expectation value is 2. Now when we talked about measurements, if you make a measurement, the probability that you're only going to get either 1 or 4. You can't get 2. 2 is just the average of a large number of measurements. If if you measure it, you're either going to get 1 or 4, and there's a 2 thirds probability you get 1, and a 1 third probability you get 4. So this would be the, if I would just write down what this f of x would be, this f of x, f of x would be square root of 1 third psi 2 of x plus square root of 2 thirds psi 1 of x, where this psi 1 for n equals 1 and psi 2 for n equals 2. So I'll make this a little bit more concrete in the next video and do a more specific example for the particle in a box and we'll see what the consequences are uh, for that model system.